In case you're just joining us, we are concluding our series on the minor prophet book Habakkuk today, and I want to let the <laughs> the junior higher, well, middle schoolers, see, that's how old I am. I used to call it junior high. Middle schoolers, you can head on out. Uh, they have their class here today. So um, Habakkuk is a minor prophet book, just three chapters long, and what's unique about it is it is a conversation between the prophet and God, the entire three chapters. And so we're going to conclude today with chapter three. We're going to finish it up here today. And um, just to bring you up to speed on where we've been, Habakkuk has been complaining. Have you ever complained? Have you, did you complain this morning? Getting ready, coming in. You know, we complain. And Here's one of the things I'm learning about the Lord. He does not like complaining at all. Children of Israel tried that, remember? And he got so fed up with it that he said, listen, his long suffering, his, his mercy came to an end with him. And he said, that's it. You've complained one time too many. You're all going to die in the desert. You're not going to the promised land. Because they complained. Complain is a complete opposite of faith. It's saying, listen, things aren't going my way. I deserve it. And God, why aren't you making it happen? Now, Habakkuk's complaints, and he has two of them we see in chapter 1, uh, were because he didn't understand what God was doing. His nation was in spiritual decline. Wickedness was prevalent. And he's like, God, don't you see? Don't you care? Why don't you save us? Reminds me of some of the prayers people have been praying in our country for since I was a kid, and that's, Lord, send revival, send revival, send revival, and it's getting worse, and it gets worse. The morality it gets worse and worse, and like it's the complete opposite of what we're praying. And that's what Habakkuk is seeing, and so he's frustrated, and he's complaining. Reminds me of a story of a monk who took a vow of silence. And he was only allowed one time a year to go before his supervisor and give a two-word response to a question. So after the very first year, his supervisor sits down with him and said, well, what do you have to say after your first year as a monk? All he could say was, food, bad. That's all he said for that entire first year. The second year, he goes through the second year, fulfilling his vow of silence, says nothing, Supervisor interviews him for the year. What do you have to say for yourself this year? Bed hard. He goes through his third year. Third year interview, okay. Food bad, bed hard. What do you have to say for yourself this year? I quit. His superior said, honestly, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. <laughs> no, God doesn't enjoy complaining. And Habakkuk starts complaining. Again, two complaints. One, God, aren't you going to do something about all the wrongs going on in Judah and our nation? God's response to that was, I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish you. That's not the response he was looking for. And so um, he complains again. <laughs> he says, well, God, now tell me this makes sense. How come you would use a people more wicked than we are to punish us? Yeah, we're bad, but they're way worse. And God's answer to that is, I'm going to deal with them later. But I'm taking care of you by using them as an instrument to bring about judgment on you for your sins. And so Habakkuk, obviously, like we would be, was not happy with that response. And so what we see in, in, the, in chapter 3 now is that we see he's, he's done an about face. He has come to terms with God's response. And it, it started chapter 3 last week. We read it uh, with a prayer put to music. It said this in Habakkuk uh, 3, 2, Lord, I have heard of your fame. And I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath. He said, okay, God, I know what you're going to do. I don't like it. But in wrath, would you please remember mercy? And this, of course, this prayer was put to music. 
And so what we're going to see now, and I'm going to read this fairly quickly and focus on, on verses 16, 17, 18, 19 as we close this out. Uh, the next 12 verses or so, verses 3 to 15, are poetry. Really, it's a poetic way of describing God as a warrior. And so we're just going to read through this fairly quickly, but God is the warrior who is roused to take vengeance on Judah's enemies, on Israel's enemies. So, so uh, let's go ahead and read that. Verse 3, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, and His glory covered the heavens, and His praise filled the earth, and His splendor was like the sunrise, and rays flashed from His hand where His power was hidden. It's kind of, I don't know, Avenger-like. Plague went before him, and pestilence followed his steps. It's kind of COVID-like. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble, and the ancient mountains crumbled, and the age-old hills collapsed. And But he, God, he marches on forever. And I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, and the dwellings of Midian in anguish, and were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? So, again, this is a picture of God as the warrior coming to get vengeance on the nation that he used to correct his nation. You uncovered your bow and you called for many arrows, and you split the earth with rivers, and the mountains you saw you and writhed, and torrents of water swept by, and the deep roared and lifted its waves on high. And the sun and the moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows and at the lightning of your flashing spear. And in wrath you strode through the earth, and in your anger you threshed the nations. And you came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. And you crushed the leader. He must be taking delight in this, seeing this in the future. The leader of the land of wickedness, and you stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. And you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great water. So here Habakkuk is picturing the day when God dishes out to the Babylonians a taste of the medicine they have inflicted upon Israel. And now what we're going to see is... Um, Really, things begin to change. He's in awe of God. He's in fear of God. He says this in Habakkuk 3.16. The effect of the prophet on seeing the Lord uh, turns him to like his legs to jelly. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound and decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. And now Habakkuk has these three responses. And uh, actually, it was a good prayer that God would give us the grace to respond similarly in the midst of our decaying world and what's going on in the world today. But there's three responses that show that he has now made a transition from going from faith, fear rather, to faith. He has transitioned from complaining to God, not liking the response, complaining again, and really <laughs> being disillusioned. But all of a sudden, things change. What has changed? The circumstances haven't changed. God is still going to use Babylon to punish Judah. It's still going to happen. So what has changed? Why is he no longer complaining? Why has he been lifted out from a place of fear to now a place of faith and trust in God? What changed? The only thing that changed was his mind, his perspective on what was going on. And can I tell you, you may be in a place right now in your life where you are tempted to complain. Maybe you've lost a loved one, you're battling an illness, your relationships are in trouble, or I, I don't know what it is, but you're in a place where you know what? You could complain right now. You're disillusioned, you're discouraged. It hasn't gone your way. Can I tell you, nothing changed in Habakkuk's circumstances. And nothing needs to change in yours. Hear what I'm saying here. <laughs> nothing needs to change in our lives for us to go from a place from fear to faith except 
what we're focusing on, what we're trusting in. Circumstances are painful for all of us at different times. But the lesson of Habakkuk is, what are you going to do when you don't like what God's doing, when you don't understand fully what He's doing, but you, re- you get it, it's not changing. What are you going to do when it doesn't change? What are you going to do when things don't go your way? You're going to stay in a place of complaint? You're going to stay in a place of fear? You're going to stay in, a, in constant anxiety, fret? Or you're going to make the transition. Here are three responses of Habakkuk that shows that he has gone from a place of fear to a place of faith, even though God hasn't changed his mind, the circumstances are not changing. And here's the first thing. He's learned to wait on the timing of the Lord. He says, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And that was not going to be for more than 70 years in the future. He wasn't going to see it with his own eyes, most likely. But but he said, it doesn't matter. God said he's going to exact vengeance on the enemies. It'll happen, but I'm taking the long view here. It's not going to happen when I want it to, how I want it to, regardless. He's God and I'm not. He's in control and I'm not. I'm just going to patiently wait on him. Have you ever done that? Pray to prayer. Ask God for help or his intervention, and it hasn't gone according to your timetable. Because we want things fixed now. That's what I like. (laughs) What do you do when God says no or when it's wait? It's hard for many of us. We're doers, not waiters. Yet the Christian life often requires waiting, patience. Psalm 131.2, but I have calmed and quieted myself. Any of us need to do that here today? Because you've got a a boiling pot of anxiety or worry. (laughs) No, calm, quiet yourself. I'm like a, a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I'm content. You know, a baby that's nursing, when they're hungry, they're not content with anything. But once they're weaned and they can get some solid food, it takes a little longer to digest after they eat, yeah, they're content for a while. You know, we need to be a place in, in a place where even in the middle of the ups and downs of life and the trials of life, we can endure with joy. Have you figured this out yet? That suffering is not something that we get a pass on in life. And there's two ways to suffer. There's one for we suffer for doing something stupid. There's no glory in that. And two, there's suffering for doing what's right. And there is glory in that. So what do you do if you're suffering for a bad decision you made or a bad choice that you made? That's when I ask for God's mercy. Repent. God, I own this. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have driven 100 miles an hour in a 25. Lord, I I shouldn't have cheated on my spouse. I shouldn't have whatever. I shouldn't have. Now, I'm reaping what I'm sowing. I don't like what I'm reaping, but God, please forgive me. And that's when we appeal to God's mercy. And sometimes He lets you off easy, and sometimes He doesn't. I told you the story about when I bought a house, and stupid, and for 10 years I tried to sell it, and just God said, no, I'm not going to sell it. Showed up thousands of dollars in the whole years later. I had to show 10 years later with money at the closing just to get rid of it. God said, no, you're not getting the easy way out. Sometimes it's like that. When we do something stupid and we're suffering, appeal to His mercy, and repent, get your heart clean. But other times we're, we're suffering for doing the right thing. And that's when you ask for His grace. It's sufficient for us. 
But that is normal for a Christian to do the right thing and suffer. And that's what we don't like. It doesn't seem fair. Or why do I have to endure this? I'm doing the right thing. I've forgiven, and that's still going on. I'm keeping my heart clean, yet I'm still getting pushed back. I'm being mistreated, Lord, but you know that I'm trying to follow you in the way I should. Peter talks about it. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you. And here's partly why we have suffering when we do the right thing, to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. The sufferings of Christ, He was suffering for doing the right thing. And we participate sometimes in those sufferings. When you stand up to someone who's touting an immoral agenda, People just want you to shut up. Just let it go when you say, I can't. My conscience won't let me. And they talk about you behind your back like a dog. Call you names. Now you're suffering, but you're suffering for the right reason. When you come to faith in Christ, like I'm thinking of a lady in our former church, and her husband was not excited about it. And she said, well, the Scripture tells me that I'm not to leave my spouse, you know, unless there's adultery, and he hasn't committed adultery on me. He's just mad at me for giving my life to Christ. And it was 43 years she's still living in that same situation. That's suffering. A lot of people would advise her, just get out of it. You deserve to be happy. She's like, no, I, I made a commitment before God, and He's not cheating on me. He's just not happy that I'm a Christian, and it's hard every day, but I'm going to do what is right. That's suffering. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. When's the last time someone called you a name or stereotyped you? Because you took a stand for the right reason. That's normal. You're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, through these kind of sufferings, we understand that our faith is real and that we're not going to cave to pressure because we believe and want to honor God. We believe in Him, we believe in His Word, we want to honor Him. We want to be a light in a dark place. Verse 15, but if you suffer, you should not be doing it for something stupid. Don't be a murderer. Don't be a thief. Don't be a criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The Bible says that we are His children when we come to faith in Christ, and God will discipline us. Why? Because we're loved. We've got some parents here. Parents that love their children are careful to discipline their children. Now, it's easier just in the short term, just let them do their own thing and th throw a movie in and not correct them. But how many know they grow up to be little monsters? <laughs> who disrespect authority and will do whatever they can and manipulate whatever. No, it takes work to discipline a child. But that's what love looks like. Love takes the time and the inconvenience to discipline. God loves His children. So He takes the time for all of us to discipline us, to correct us. And I don't like it any more than you do, right? So when we're going through or enduring a trial, suffering, if it's for the wrong reason, something stupid we did, repent and ask for mercy. If it's for the right reason, endure it and allow that trial, to, 
patiently endure that trial and allow it to test your faith and grow your trust in Him. It's a refining process. And so Habakkuk is there. All right, God, I'm not going to try to change your mind anymore. You're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to use the people you're going to use. I'm resolved to that. I'm going to patiently wait for you to do what you said you're going to do. And then he goes, here's the second response, verse 17 to 18. And that is Habakkuk resolves to delight in God. Now he begins to talk about, all right, Babylon's coming. With Babylon coming, we're going to lose our wealth. We're going to lose our food supply. We're going to be enslaved. Uh, This is not going to be pretty. He goes on to say, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. So what's he talking? This is an agrarian society. I mean, the sheep and the cattle, that's their income. The, the vineyards and the orchards and uh, the fields, that's their source of living. And he said, when all this dries up, here's what I'm going to do. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God, God my Savior, in God my Savior. I will rejoice. What if it doesn't go your way? What if the things you've been praying about never change? What if the relationship doesn't get better? What if the sickness gets worse? What if, fill in the blank, worst case scenario, what if? What are you going to do? When you go from a place of fear to faith, you're resolved. You know what? may never go my way. It may never get better. I'm still praying it does. I hope it does. But if it doesn't, what will I do? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. When only God is left, if all I have is God, is that enough? How much do we depend on our income, our our health, our relationships, our security for our joy? You know, as you look at the Scripture, rarely does God ask a believer to give all that he or she has. But do we value our salvation and our relationship with God above all other things? I was reading, uh, occasionally I'll sit down with Lisa and William now because Joseph's pretty much grown up, getting married here. And so we'll do occasionally in the mornings, we'll read through a scripture or whatever. And I read through uh, Matthew thirteen forty four recently. I was talking about the parables that Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God in that chapter. And we came across this one. Where Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought the field. The kingdom of heaven is the most valuable thing that we have. And our soul, which is made to last forever, is the most valuable possession that God gives us. What does it profit a man if he gains everything in this world and loses his own soul? But once you see that God has given you the kingdom, it is worth pursuing with everything in us. It's the most valuable thing. And when God is big and when his kingdom is big, our problems then in light of eternity, are small. But when all we see are our problems and our problems are big, then God seems small. Habakkuk's eyes have been opened to see where his delight should have been in the first place. 
And God's discipline over this nation, God's responses have put Habakkuk in a place where he is now joyful. We cannot cling to the things of earth and expect to find joy and peace. It is in abandoning and surrendering to God and to His sovereign and His providential ways that we find our joy and peace. God becomes our greatest joy. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into trials of many kinds because you know the trying of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance must have its perfect work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Your, your faith is tested. My faith is tested in the furnace of trials. But in the middle of that pain, in the middle of that suffering, that's when you see that your faith is genuine. It is real. I remember the, I have a single worst day as the pastor of the Rock Church. And it was that day that I found out that a 25-year-old, 25-year relationship with a friend that I had who was a part of our church had hurt one of my children, someone I trusted. And I'll never forget when I heard about it. Um, I had always said, if you hurt me, eh, that's one thing, but you hurt my kids, I'll kill you. And then it happened. And I'll never forget where I was when my wife told me we were on a walk. She said, I gotta, she had this look like death warmed over. We have to go for a walk. And she told me what had happened. And in my flesh, you know, I, I wanted revenge. But through that trial, what I found was forgiveness. Now, I did the natural thing, got a protection order, went to the authorities, did everything I could naturally to protect. But in my heart, I knew I had to forgive. And I knew, you know what? God is God. And vengeance belongs to Him. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And my job is to keep my heart pure and clean and to obey Him. That was the worst day I've had at the rock. I wonder, when we can't fix things, when things are broken, when things, wrongs have been done, when, when life is hard and when we're suffering, can we still do the right thing and delight in the Lord? Habakkuk has reached that place God, I'm going to patiently wait for your response. It may never go my way in my lifetime. But regardless of what comes, I'm going to delight in you. Because your kingdom is my first desire. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. And finally, and here's how you know you've crossed from fear to faith. He commits himself to praise, not to complaining. If we are complaining about anything, we haven't crossed over in our faith. Again, God hates complaining. The language of faith is a language of praise. It's a language of gratitude. And he goes on to say, the sovereign Lord is my strength. And he makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. <laughs> Got to tread on the heights like a big buck. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. His heart sings to God. His heart sings to the God who lifts him above the gloomy circumstances of his present situation, of his, his sinful nation, and of his personal disappointment and loss of wealth. It doesn't matter. His heart sings to God who lifts him above his circumstances. 
and he has confidence like a deer bounding around on the hilltops. He begins to think right. God's in charge. He sees himself correctly. God sees me. God loves me. He has not forgotten me. And he responds accordingly. Habakkuk has discovered the secret of moving from fear to faith. And that is in his praise and his thanksgiving to God. Thanking God is acknowledging what God has done for us and given us. And praising God is admiring, applauding, and delighting in who God is. And Habakkuk praises the God who opened the eyes of a grumpy prophet. And now he's lifting his gaze above the circumstances, above the chaos, above the complaints, above what he personally has distaste and disdain for. Lift up my eyes to whence to the hills, words cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And he's filled with joy and peace. And what God has done for this prophet, he can do for you. And nothing has to change externally for that to happen. Things don't have to roll your way, go your way. You just have to lift your vision a little higher and see the God who is almighty and all-powerful and all-loving, the one that we worship and adore. Would you bow your heads with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, from a, a macro level, we look at our nation and the division, the economic challenges, the uncertainty. We fix our eyes there. We can just get discouraged, full of fear for the future, fear for our children and grandchildren. On a micro level, Lord, we look at our own lives. And we were battling with illness or disappointing marriage, a financial issue, Lord, whatever it is, we all have the opportunity to either magnify the problems and as a result be full of fear or magnify the problem solver and be full of faith. We know, Lord, that you are sovereign, almighty, all-powerful, that your will will prevail ultimately. And we know that you've told us you love us. That you keep our tears in a bottle. You count the hairs on our head. We know there's so many wonderful promises you've given us in your word to those that love you, that all things would work together for good. Those who love you and are called according to the, your purpose. Lord, we know that you are faithful. And we know even when we don't understand, even when we don't like it, even when there's tribulation and suffering, that we can trust you. And we put our faith in you. And we count it all joy in the middle of trials. Father, let your Holy Spirit now just wrap us in your grace as we put our trust in you, Jesus. And friend, if you've never called out to God asking for forgiveness of your sins, asking for his mercy in your life, I want to encourage you just to do that. By faith, put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who gave himself on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. Put your hope in him. Put your faith in him. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. We delight in you. We bless your holy name.